Hello everyone, welcome to 10 Minute Physiology. In today's video, we're going to talk about how aldosterone secretion is regulated by our bodies. So with that, let's give it a go. So in this video, we're going to talk about two main things. The first thing is we're going to see how three different substances affect aldosterone secretion. So we're going to look at angiotensin 2, high extracellular potassium levels, and ACTH and see how they affect aldosterone secretion. Then we're going to finish up this video by talking about two cycles that are used to regulate aldosterone secretion. So let's begin this video by talking about how angiotensin 2 affects aldosterone secretion. So before we talk about how angiotensin II affects aldosterone secretion, it's important to have an understanding of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is a system that starts off with the liver. So the liver is responsible for synthesizing and producing angiotensinogen. Now angiotensinogen is a precursor protein, and in order to form another product, this precursor protein has to encounter an enzyme. And this enzyme is going to be synthesized and released from the kidneys. And this enzyme is called renin. So renin is an enzyme that is synthesized by the granular cells in the juxtaglomerular apparatus in the kidneys. And what renin does is it catalyzes the conversion of angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. So after angiotensin 1 is formed, in order to form angiotensin 2, angiotensin 1 needs to interact with another enzyme. And this enzyme can be found in the lungs, specifically the vascular endothelium, as well as other places in the body. So angiotensin 1 is going to be converted into angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE. And as I said before, 40% of ACE is going to be present in the vascular endothelium of the lung, whereas 60% is going to be found elsewhere. So this is how angiotensin 2 is going to be formed in the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So now that we know how angiotensin 2 is formed, what are the effects of angiotensin 2 on the adrenal cortex? So this is a diagram showing you a cell of the adrenal cortex, and this is going to be in the zona glomerulosa. So on this side of the screen, we have the interstitial fluid, which is the fluid that bathes the cell. And then on the opposite side of the screen, we have the cytoplasm. And separating these two fluid compartments is the plasma membrane. Now inside the cell, we have the endoplasmic reticulum as well as the mitochondria. But please know that these drawings are not to scale. So how does angiotensin 2 affect aldosterone secretion? Well, in order for angiotensin 2 to have an effect on aldosterone secretion, it needs to have a receptor. And the receptor that's present is going to be the AT1 receptor. So the AT1 receptor is a G protein coupled receptor that is coupled to a GQ protein. So when angiotensin 2 binds to the AT1 receptor, the GQ protein is activated, which then activates another enzyme called phospholipase C. So phospholipase C catalyzes the conversion of PIP2 into IP3 and diacylglycerol. So what are the effects of IP3? So after phospholipase C generates IP3, the IP3 goes into the cytoplasm. And once it's in the cytoplasm, it can interact with the IP3 receptors that can be found on the endoplasmic reticulum. So when IP3 binds to its receptor, it causes a conformational change which opens the receptor, which therefore allows calcium to flow out of the endoplasmic reticulum and into the cytoplasm. So how does calcium affect the cell? So one of the many effects of calcium is that it's actually going to activate an enzyme called protein kinase C. Now protein kinase C is going to be used for a number of different processes that we'll talk about in a little bit, but before we do that, what are the effects of diacylglycerol? So remember that phospholipase C also produces diacylglycerol. So diacylglycerol, when it's generated, will also activate protein kinase C, leading to a specific set of effects. So what is the effect of protein kinase C? Well, protein kinase C is going to phosphorylate transcription factors that stimulate aldosterone synthesis. So protein kinase C increases aldosterone synthesis in the adrenal cortex. So what are some other effects of calcium? Well, calcium is also going to activate calcium calmodulin kinases. And these calcium calmodulin kinases have the same effect as protein kinase C. They will phosphorylate transcription factors that stimulate aldosterone synthesis. Now, calcium also has a number of other effects in the adrenal cortex cell. 
So since calcium has a positive charge, this positive charge will cause the membrane to depolarize. And when the cell depolarizes, this will open voltage-gated calcium channels, which therefore allows calcium to flow into the cell, therefore increasing calcium levels in the cytosol, therefore further increasing the effects of calcium. Now, another effect of calcium is actually going to be seen in the mitochondria. So remember that in the adrenal cortex, we have many different steps in aldosterone synthesis. Some of these steps are in the mitochondria and other steps are in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now calcium is going to affect two steps in the mitochondria. So the first step that it's going to affect is going to be the SCC enzyme. So the SCC enzyme or side chain cleavage enzyme is responsible for catalyzing the rate determining step of aldosterone synthesis. And this rate determining step is the conversion of cholesterol into pregnenolone. So by activating this enzyme, we increase aldosterone synthesis. Another possible effect of calcium is it's going to increase the uptake of cholesterol by the mitochondria. So by supplying more cholesterol to the mitochondria, this therefore allows the cell to produce more aldosterone. So the second effect of calcium in the mitochondria is going to be in another step of aldosterone synthesis. And this step is going to be catalyzed by aldosterone synthase. So aldosterone synthase catalyzes the conversion of corticosterone into aldosterone. And calcium is actually going to activate this enzyme and therefore allow the cell to produce more aldosterone. So what is the overall effect of angiotensin II on the adrenal cortex? The overall effect of angiotensin II is that it's going to increase aldosterone synthesis and secretion. So now that we know what angiotensin II does, how does high extracellular potassium levels affect aldosterone secretion? Well, if we were to look at our diagram of the adrenal cortex cell, we see that in the ISF or the interstitial fluid that we have high extracellular potassium. How would this affect the adrenal cortex cell? Well, inside the plasma membrane, we have potassium leak channels. And remember that potassium leak channels are channels that allow potassium to flow down its electrochemical gradient. So potassium flows from the cytosol into the interstitial fluid. Now, potassium is going to have a positive charge on it. So when potassium leaves the cell, this causes positive charge to leave the cell as well. Therefore, it keeps the cell at a negative resting potential. Now, what happens when we have high extracellular potassium? Well, when we have high extracellular potassium, this will decrease the electrochemical gradient for potassium across the plasma membrane of the cell. And this will basically inhibit the movement of potassium from the cytosol into the interstitial fluid. As a result of this, less positive charges leave the cell. Therefore, this leads to the plasma membrane depolarizing. And when the plasma membrane depolarizes, this opens voltage-gated calcium channels, which allows calcium to flow into the cytosol. Now, what are the effects of calcium? So calcium is going to have the same effects that we talked about for angiotensin II. So the overall effect of high extracellular potassium on the adrenal cortex is that it stimulates aldosterone synthesis and secretion. So the final substance that we're going to look at is ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone. So how does ACTH affect aldosterone synthesis and secretion. So in order for ACTH to have its effects, it needs to have a receptor. And the receptor that it can bind to is the melanocortin-2 receptor. Now the melanocortin-2 receptor is a G protein coupled receptor, and it's going to be coupled to a GS protein. So when ACTH binds to the melanocortin-2 receptor, this activates the GS protein, which then activates adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase will then catalyze the conversion of ATP into cyclic AMP, and then cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. And protein kinase A has a number of effects. So the first effect of protein kinase A is it's going to increase the activity of the SCC enzyme. Remember that the SCC enzyme catalyzes the rate determining step of aldosterone synthesis. In addition, protein kinase A will also increase the synthesis of different enzymes that are used in aldosterone synthesis. In addition, protein kinase A will also increase the synthesis of the LDL receptor. This allows these cells to take up more cholesterol, which therefore allows these cells to synthesize more aldosterone. And then lastly, protein kinase A will also increase the synthesis of HMG-CoA reductase. And this is the enzyme that catalyzes the rate-determining step of cholesterol synthesis. This allows the cell to produce more cholesterol, which therefore allows the cell to produce more aldosterone. So in summary, ACTH stimulates the adrenal cortex to synthesize and secrete aldosterone.
aldosterone. So we've been talking a lot about different substances that stimulate aldosterone synthesis. However, it's important for us to be able to turn off aldosterone secretion. And this is done through negative feedback cycles. So now we're gonna finish off by talking about two negative feedback cycles used to regulate aldosterone secretion. So the first negative feedback cycle is seen in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So what does this negative feedback cycle look like? So let's just say we decrease the effective circulating volume in our body. So a decreased effective circulating volume will stimulate the juxtaglomerular apparatus of the kidney to produce renin. So as you know, renin catalyzes the conversion of angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then converted by ACE into angiotensin 2. So remember that angiotensin 2 will then stimulate the adrenal gland to produce aldosterone. So this is where the negative feedback cycle really begins. So aldosterone, remember, is going to increase renal sodium reabsorption in the kidney. And this will cause water to follow that sodium. And when we increase sodium and water reabsorption in the kidney, this will lead to an increased effective circulating volume and also increase in the blood pressure. This increase in the effective circulating volume and blood pressure will lead to the inhibition of the granular cells from releasing renin. So this increase in effective circulating volume and blood pressure inhibits the granular cells of the juxtaglomerular apparatus from producing renin. So it decreases renin production by these cells and therefore decreases the conversion of angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1 and therefore it decreases the amount of angiotensin 2 and therefore it decreases the stimulation of the adrenal gland and therefore decreases the release of aldosterone. So this is the first negative feedback that we see in this diagram. Now in addition, angiotensin 2 will also inhibit the granular cells of the juxtaglomerular apparatus from releasing renin. So this is more of a short loop feedback that we can see here as well. So angiotensin 2, remember, will also increase the systemic arterial pressure. And when we increase the systemic arterial pressure, this will also inhibit the granular cells in the juxtaglomerular apparatus from releasing renin. So these are all ways in which we have negative feedback on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which prevents aldosterone from being over secreted. So the last negative feedback cycle that we'll look at is the one for potassium. So remember that when we have increased plasma potassium or a high extracellular potassium, this will stimulate the adrenal gland to produce and secrete aldosterone. So remember that aldosterone is going to increase renal sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion. This will therefore cause potassium levels to fall towards normal range. And when this happens, this inhibits the adrenal gland from release aldosterone. So this is the second negative feedback cycle that we see in our body for aldosterone release. So that's it for this video. I hope this video helped you understand how aldosterone secretion is regulated in our bodies and I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.